right. Oklahoma. This is in Oklahoma, just east of here. I'm going to talk about forested systems. What's a forester doing in Oklahoma? That's always a very good question. I'm supposed to be tethered to this, uh, tethered to, to this, so you, they can record. Um, what's a forester doing in Oklahoma? First thing, we have forests in Oklahoma. This is one. This is an example. It's an example of a restored oak pine savanna system. Everyone can hear me in the back? I'm a loud person. No problem. <laughs> it's an oak pine savanna system. Uh, we're not going to talk about Oklahoma for a while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of range out of here. But mostly what I want to talk about today is if you work in forested system, sort of to provide a contrast to what, what John just presented um, and what, what it we're going to talk about coastal systems next after this, but really a forested landscape. So the U.S. is heavily, heavily forested, not including Canada, not including um, Alaska. If you look at the U.S. in, in general, it's, it, there's a beautiful book, Marion Clary, I think it's his name, uh, a historian, it's This Well-Wooded Land, um, talks about um, just forests in the U.S. and the history of forests. So except for this, this middle part of the Great Plains, um, the entire western U.S., um, heavily forested. Some of that is dry. Much of that is dry. All the northern parts, um, all the eastern parts, all the southern parts, heavily, heavily forested lands. And when you work in forests, you just have to take a very different perspective. Um, oftentimes, oftentimes an uncomfortable perspective. So I just kind of wanted to walk through some of that stuff. So it's nice to have a contrast. Uh, let's shoot up to British Columbia. So obviously British Columbia, you can see in the bottom left there, um, Vancouver Island, Pacific Ocean off on, on the left, um, Seattle, down here, well, here, um, Vancouver. I used to live in Vancouver, worked at University of British Columbia. Uh, but where we're going to talk is, and these are forest types. It doesn't matter what the colors are. Um, in this particular case, what you've got, I'm going to shift away a little bit here, the coastal forests in green. You've got a coast range, which is here. So these are alpine areas, and then a rain shadow. Uh, this whole area is a rain shadow. This is your ponderosa pine type, sort of the orange type. This is the Rocky Mountains right here, sort of stretching up. Alberta over here, oil sands. This is the Rocky Mountains, stretches up into there. Uh, you know, so Montana down here stretches up. But it's this entire interior, this, this purple type that I'm going to talk about. It's a very large, relatively flat um, interior plain, um, and it's spruce and fir and pine. It looks a lot like this. Um, Parts of it looks a lot like this in the summertime, but it's, it's largely spruce. And so what you, you would see these forests up in sort of high elevation areas in the U.S., in the Rockies, maybe about 10,000 feet, depending on where you are, 5,000, 10,000 feet. Um, this is not nearly that high, but it's a high latitude forest. So it works the same as a high elevation forest. But it's a mix of hardwood species. It's a mix of spruce. It's a mix of, of pine, largely uh, lodgepole pine in this particular case. And it's quite mixed up. Um, it's very, very productive, and it's a very large area. If we go back, uh, British Columbia is the size of Texas and Oklahoma put together. Um, and so you can sort of see what the center part of this area is. It, it's, it's a very large, massive area. Um, it's completely forested. Even when you get up into the, rock, into the Rockies or into the Coast Range, um, you know, the forest stretch pretty high elevation as well. So, but this central area... Um, it's going through some pretty massive changes right now. This is what it largely looks like. It's warm. You have a, have a short growing season, but it's warm, plenty of water, so very, very productive system. Much of it looks like this right now. So this is maybe about five years ago, um, ten years ago, took these photos. Anybody know what the, the famous red tree is in this particular case? Interactive. Any idea what the famous red tree is? It's, it's a dead tree, right? So it's a pine tree. Yeah, these are pine trees. These got hit by a massive, massive um, bark beetle epidemic. So, and I'll show you the, the spread of that bark, be bark beetle epidemic. They go after, it's an, you know, it's, it's an indigenous, it's a native insect, um, but they go after essentially pines. They don't go after the spruce or the fir that are in that area, the other conifers. Um, but they go after the pine, and they go after the larger pine. In this particular case, the stuff that's in the back, um, there's pine in the foreground, but it's just not, it's, it's too small to, to hold it. They, they burrow in under the bark, um, they live in the cambium, they have a, a fungus um, that's associated with them, it's called a blue stain fungus that, that plugs up the pipes, and the trees essentially die of, of drought is what happens, but it happens relatively quickly. And these trees died relatively quickly because they still have their needles 
So they just died of drought and they hold their needles for a while and then they, it drops off. But much of the area looks like this. Go through a few aerial photographs. Uh, what you have left in there are, are non-pines. Um, you have a couple of red trees, which are recent kills. Um, the, the bark beetles come back through them. And then skeleton trees as well, which are the white ones. Um, those were killed a while ago. So, but much of it is, much of it looks very much like that. Let me go out of here for half a second. Cumulative pine kill, 1999, and then projections. This is up through 2011, then projections 2012 to 20, um, 2020. Uh, the outbreak started really around here. Prince George is the center of, of commerce in sort of the central British Columbia area. Campus is pretty far down Wyoming Lake. Uh, but it started on the, the western side, and then winds are prevailing from the west. Um, it just started. It just there was an outbreak. It just the, the population built up. Talk about that in a second here as to why. Um, but the population built up. 1999, they started to see some kill. 2000, red is current outbreak. 2001, I'm going to flip through this. 2002, it really started to get going in that central area and then started to spread east as well. Now we're starting to get the gray. That is 100% dead. So red is an active outbreak. In this case, um, the gray is it's completely dead. Um, all the pine is dead in that area except the very young stuff. It just spreads, it spreads, it spreads. 2008, 2009, 2010, it's kind of 2008, 2009, was up, I was up there. Um, it looks much like this. The worry now is that it was going to spread east over the Rockies and into some fairly large pine areas in Alberta as well. Um, they, were, they were starting to see it when I was up there, and it has happened. The Rockies are that sort of right here, this white area. Um, 2010, 2011, 2012, pretty much complete and absolute. Um, now these are projections forward, but the projections so far have been pretty good in terms of this massive outbreak. I mean, just, just absolutely massive outbreak. So why... Why did this happen? Why am I talking about it? A couple of things. First of all, just go back up a couple to about 2012, which is projected, but let's go, the last one was really not projected, so 2010. So what happened, this is in, in a native insect um, in this particular case. It's a, it's a heavily forested area, but that insect is controlled through temperature, largely. So very severe winters. If you get, you have to get down to be about below minus 30, which is Fahrenheit Celsius, so it's about the same, and that right at that point, but about minus 30 for at least a week, because it overwinters in the Cambium area, and you have to essentially kill that larvae um, there in that Cambium area to reduce the population pressure for the next summer that comes out. They're having very, very, very warm winters, and they've had a string of warm winters, um, starting going back about two decades now. Um, and that population pressure just built up. Um, there was really nothing else that happened. Um, the forest hasn't been changed. Um, you don't, it, it wasn't a massive uh, change in, in vegetation type because most of that area is fairly natural. There's a lot of logging in that area. Uh, there's a lot of, of timber activity, but most of the forest hasn't been touched, um, especially in the area that was, that was harvested. Right? Um, some of it has. There's a bit more pine um, than there used to be, um, but for the most part, it really hasn't. Um, it's, it was just a really natural occurrence. Sort of. It doesn't really matter to me. It was a natural occurrence. Um, I mean, it was an expected occurrence with climate changing, whether that was anthropogenic or not. It was an expected occurrence. Right? The, the temperature just increases. Uh, you don't have the kill. You have these population explosions. We've seen this in other places. Talk about this in the western U.S. because we have the same thing happening in the western U.S. for a couple of different reasons all throughout the Rocky Mountains, sort of in this, in this U.S. part. But really, it, it just changed. But the human dimension is, is actually kind of interesting as well. So get back to that. British Columbia forest resources. There's a lot of people that live up there. British Columbia is a heavily, heavily extractive company or um, province, country, um, Canada as well. It's heavily extractive. Timber, 
fisheries oil. I mean, that's what British Columbia is all about. Um, it doesn't have much of a, um, in, you know, it doesn't have much of a, a white collar industry. It's very, very, very extractive. So fisheries and, and timber, certainly. You have this major outbreak in 1999. Now, British Columbia is kind of odd in terms of how it has land ownership. Most of Canada, and certainly British Columbia as well, is owned by the crown. It's owned by the province, not by the federal government, but owned by the province itself. So 94% of Canada is owned by the provinces. Um, very little private land, except in the cities, but you know, Canada's a very large area in this particular case. In British Columbia, about 50% of that forested land has never been harvested. You saw that there's a, there's a very large timber, timber industry there, but it, most of it has never been harvested. And so there's sort of this frontier mentality. It's, it's an endless, bountiful resource. Off we go, right? We're just going to kind of move north um, and, and, and cut. And there's, there's sawmills, there's paper mills, there's all kinds of, all kinds of sort of fiber-related activity up there. And it's, it's a big driver of their, of their economy, especially in that central area. They do not have a land tenure system. Um, it's not like the national forests that own the land and manage the land and then sell timber um, sort of to the highest bidder. What they have is um, an annual allowable cut for management units. And these management units are kind of weird. They're usually tied to a mill in this particular case. Right? They're historical. They're tied to a mill, whether it's a, a, a sawmill or a pulp mill. And they say, all right, well, you have this much timber that you're allowed to cut off of crown lands. And we're going to sort of tell you where you can do this, and you're, you're going to pay a certain set price. The set price is about half of what market price is in this particular case. Um, so they're really just sort of giving the, the wood away, largely, to support industry and support communities. Um, the U.S. Forest Service used to do that for decades and decades. They don't do it anymore, but they used to do that for decades as well. They used to really sell timber in the U.S. at, a, at well below market value, but they're still doing it up in British Columbia. There's some lawsuits associated with that, with the World Trade Organization, um, in this particular case. And but they have these annual allowable cut units. The interesting part about it is that when they harvest the land, they just cut. What they have to do is they have to regenerate it. They have to regenerate it back to about two meters tall, sort of well-distributed trees, two meters tall, of a commercial species. And then they give it back to the crown. They don't manage that next rotation, right? So these are 60, 80 year old trees. Actually, these are several hundred year old trees that they're harvesting. They're going into areas that have never been harvested, but typically it'd be about 80 years until the next rotation. Um, but they just give it back. They have no stake in that management. They have no stake in sort of controlling that land, fertilizing what tree species goes on there. It just doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And they probably, as that company or that mill, they probably will never come back to that land again. It'll be someone else. So they don't have a stake in it. It's kind of just a really odd tenure system. And so what does this happen? The other part of this whole thing is what was happening around 1999, say 2005, 2006 in the US. What was going on? What was the big news? 2005, 2004, 2006, right? Your home prices were tripling like every month, it seemed like. Right? They were building houses down here like you would not believe. Just unbelievable housing bill. And we build houses with, with timber. Um, Canada and the U.S. are the only ones, only places in the world that really build houses with timber. Every, everywhere else is a masonry-based um, approach. But we build houses with timber. Um, there was also just a boom in economy, um, which is, which is paper-based economy. Um, you know, paper is, is part of that economy. Um, and so they were cutting the bejeebers out of this stuff. You have an insect explosion that's going on, killing trees. You're going to try and cut those trees before they go bad. Because if they, if they die and dry out, you can't use them, anything but basically for fiber. Um, you can't even use them in a paper system. So you have to get them right as they just die or, or certainly before. And so what does this happen? If you don't have a land tenure system, if you have an extractive economy, this is what happens. Unbelievable clear cuts. Um, you can see clear cuts up there that just stretch horizon to horizon. Um, just, just massive, massive clear cuts. And what they're trying to do is get at essentially the, the red trees before they, they, before they start to dry out and check, um, before they're really gone. Um, it's a very, very advanced timber industry up there. There's no question about it. Uh, pellets here on the right, uh, 
shipping it to Rotterdam Harbor in Europe. Um, there's a 100 million ton market every year for wood pellets uh, in Europe as part of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, just massive, very, very, very advanced timber industry. They were just gearing up. They were going to build the largest pellet mill um, in the world in that sort of central BC area to, to, to deal with some of, the, some of the dead trees and whatnot. It's just a huge, huge, huge impact. So regeneration, um, they plant it back to essentially a monoculture of black spruce um, over a very large area, sort of unharvested area off to the left, but fairly large black spruce here um, in this area. And see, that's, that's fairly typical. And it is actually a fairly typical story of the western U.S. in maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, very much a frontier mentality in that particular case, um, keeping rural economies together. Um, you know, there are a lot of good reasons for what they're doing in this case. But, but what I'm trying to do in this, in this example is just give you a sense of the scale of forestry. So the scale of, of dealing with forests on sort of an area the size of, of Texas, but a sort of a, a very wet, um, very productive area the size of Texas, Texas and Oklahoma, or say the Rocky Mountains in this particular case. We'll shift down now to sort of this the blue belt, talk about it in a second. But dealing with forests on that scale, you have to deal with multiple land ownerships. You have to deal with very, very long time scales, 80 years, 100 years between rotations. Um, Forest companies are oftentimes Fortune 500 companies, like Weyerhaeuser. They're some of the largest companies in the world in terms of their, in terms of their size, um, in terms of their income. And they are because they own a, a, typical comp a typical forest company in the southeastern U.S. will own a million acres. And that's a small company. That's a sort of a medium-sized small company. Um, 200, 300,000 acres, 400,000 acres um, in sort of this Texas, Oklahoma area is kind of a minimum size for, for dealing with with long-term decisions, 30, 40 year decisions between when you plant and when you harvest. Um, ownerships change, companies change, everything else. So dealing with, with forestry is, is really, really, really difficult. Um, on top of that, in this area where we have the forests in Oklahoma, a lot of that is small and non-industrial private landowners as well. So about half the timber resource um, that we're going to talk about in, in Oklahoma is really is non-industrial private landowners. Um, it's a lot easier to work in the western U.S. where most of, the, most of that is, is either large companies or federal lands as well. So they have the, the before I forget to get back to that, but they have the, um, the insect outbreak. Have, has anybody seen the, the sort of the insect devastation that's happened in the western U.S., for example? Has anybody been out there and seen sort of the skeleton trees and the, and the large areas in Wyoming, things like that? Some of that is bark beetles, some of that is, is, is budworm, whatnot. Um, it's essentially the same thing in many cases, essentially the same thing that's happening in central BC. Is there a climate signal? Most likely. I'm not really sure. I haven't looked at it. It doesn't really matter to me because it's happening, right? Um, we know it's, a, it's, we know it's a, a climate event in terms of, in terms of warming, um, whether it's anthropogenic or not, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, but two big differences, of course, in the western U.S., I'll just sort of mention them. Um, first of all, you don't have a very large contiguous area for that insect to, to spread to. The western U.S., typically your forests are at, at high elevations, and so they're going to be along bands along the mountains with large areas in between to get to the next forest. So it's more patchy. It's not a large area, say, the size of Texas that you're dealing with. So you're going to have a lot of really, really different sort of patchy areas in, 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 say, this isolated mountain range. You'll have a really large outbreak in this isolated mountain range. And the second one is fire suppression. So fire suppression choking the forests in terms of bringing in a lot of, of you know, removing the fire um, for largely for about 100 years now, um, effectively 70, 80 years, um, really brings in a lot of, of uh, very, very young um, Tree species for sort of shade tolerant regeneration into the understory. Um, drought stresses those trees, makes them more resist, more uh, susceptible to insects. Um, and then certainly the big fires. So they don't have the big fires up in central British Columbia. That's a big difference. Um, it's wet. It's cool. Um, they have the insect problem, but they don't have the big fires. So there are some big differences here, but but really the scale is what I wanted to talk about. And so as we move here to Oklahoma. Landscape perspectives, really the scale 
is, is a huge thing when you talk about forestry. Um, it varies, certainly spatially and temporally. Uh, the landscape scale varies by observer. So it varies as to what you're, what you're really looking at as, as a researcher or as a manager. The scale absolutely varies. It changes dramatically. I work with the Department of Defense a fair bit, and their scale is the base. That is what they're interested in. It's about, two, about say, 20, 30,000 acres, 40,000 acres, something in that range. That's what they're interested in. You deal with the Forest Service, those, that's a very large scale. It's, it's, it's sort of national forest scale. You deal with small and private landowners. The scale is largely their ownership plus the area, the other ownerships around it that have an impact um, on their ownership as around. So it, it changes. The other thing that when dealing with forests that makes it very difficult to deal with forests is the temporal scale. Um, agricultural lands have a temporal scale, but it's just it's compressed. It's not annual, absolutely not, but it's certainly compressed a fair bit. Um, forested systems, your annual scale is maybe 100 years, maybe 200 years, maybe 500 years in that particular case. So in some cases, it's quite a bit less. Um, if you go into the southern hemisphere. So, and then the last one, what, what those, you can't find a good example of variegated, but this is very mechanical term. Um, it's different. <laughs> you have to take very, lots and lots of different um, perspectives on, on landscape level, working forested research. Um, the other part of this is that forests throughout Canada, throughout the U.S., are working forests. There's almost no forest that is, that is essentially untouched, unharvested, unroaded, um, except in very, very high sort of elevation areas, wilderness areas. But for the most part, it's, it's heavily, heavily, heavily managed as well. So this blue area in the map is what was historically savanna systems in the U.S. Um, there's almost no savanna systems. So this is... you. Didn't notice the uh, the local mammals. Um, this is not the U.S. This is in South Africa, where I used to live and work for a while. But when you think of savanna systems, that's kind of what you think about, right? When you think of, of forested systems in the U.S., this is largely what we see now in this blue area. Um, but historically, it wasn't. Historically, it was a savanna system. Um, that entire blue area was. It was sort of that transition from the eastern forest to the to the Great Plains systems. And so it was sort of a woodland. There's a lot of oak. Um, there's pine as you go south. But it was largely a savanna system. Is that true? Is it not true? Let's take a look at it. So most of what you see is there on the left, heavily, heavily dense sort of oak pine um, systems. Not much understory. Um, this is just to the east of, of Norman, uh, about three hours or so in Pushmataha County. Um, the photo on the right is, was harvested back in 1984. And it's been burned every, every year since. Um, so almost going on 30 years now, basically. I think next year is going to be the 30th year that they burn that particular site. But that's the savanna system. It comes back to a tall grass prairie system. Um, very productive. This is in the spring. It was burned maybe two, three weeks ago in this particular case. It, it wet, you know, the, the rains came. It just greened up in this particular case. It's quite a beautiful system. Um, it's very rare. Um, again, it was a land use change. This is that scale that we have to deal with. It was a land use change, is what we think. Why do we have these forests here? Why do we have so much of this cross timbers forest in that blue area? So the blue area, this is the Edward Plateau, um, heavily forested. Um, it stretches up this Dallas, right? There's nothing there in that particular case. Um, stretches up, this is the Flint Hills, um, tall grass prairie. Um, all of this blue area is now just corn in this particular case. What we have left that is heavily forested is going to be sort of this swath. Oklahoma, and then a little bit up into Kansas as well. What was it historically? This is yeah, this is east of Tulsa in the Camp Gruber area, uh, military base, 1941, aerial photographs. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides that, that cycle through this, 1941 and then 2003, um, high resolution aerial photographs. 1941, heavily people, right? There was a lot of people here. Um, certainly there was a lot of people for that, but, but in terms of white settlers, statehood, everything else, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of agricultural activity in this area. Um, it was largely abandoned starting in the 30s and 40s. Um, in fact, most of it was abandoned by the 1940s. A lot of the stuff is very thin soils. Um, and so what you see, river areas with trees, these are all nat native trees, um, these are 
spirit oak species, native trees, um, essentially expand out here. So they've expanded out areas that were pasture or cropped um, have come back to trees as well. Let's zoom in a little bit. This is taken from up high. Let's zoom into a cropping area. You can see the row contours of the 1938 photograph. It's the same area, just different photograph. Um, and then the 2003 comes in. Let's zoom in a little bit, kind of off here to the right on the next one. This is all oak, by the way. There's really no pine. It's all oak. So these are both taking in, in, in summer, so leaf on conditions in this particular case. We zoom in a little bit more, you can see the characteristic of this area. So what's happening here, 1938, was the start of a very large sort of increase in the, in the oak um, forest expanse. That whole area, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, before that, 1900, was wide open prairie. Just really wide open prairie. And with land use change, um, with settlement, white settlement, um, with uh, reduction in fire in that particular case, it came back very, very strongly to oak. Um, and most of the cross timbers that we see now um, didn't really historically exist. It, it, they, they were there, certainly the tree species were there, but they didn't historically exist as a closed canopy, sort of unbroken forest. Um, it's really been a large oak invasion. So, but historically, you don't think about that. That's that, that temporal scale. You know, we think it's like, well, it's always been that way in this particular case. But I would, you know, try and find a, a young oak forest in, in this area. You just can't find it. They don't regenerate. You know, this is really a, a, a first generation forest. So this happened. So I came here from, uh, you know, my background is really uh, Pacific Northwest. Been all over the world. Um, but so I came here, and, and, and this was not a surprise to me when I came here. There's a couple of reasons for this. Some of the most productive Forest lands in the Pacific Northwest, this is Douglas fir, these trees get massive. Um, this is that coastal um, sort of temperate rainforest. 80 years old in, in the central Oregon coast range, it's just east of, or just west of Corvallis. Um, first growth forest, 100 years ago, turn of the century, there was no forest there. It was wide open, we've got the, the pho you know, photographic evidence to say this, right? But incredibly productive forest right now. It was just grassland in that particular case. So what happened is the exact same thing. It could support the trees. Obviously, it had the, the soils, the climate, to support that um, type of forest production. It is a very, very productive forest. This is 80 years old. Um, it's been thinned very, very heavily. It comes back to a, to a knife understory in this particular case. Um, these trees are about 150 feet tall, something in that range. So it's a very large forest. Um, but it was a it was, um, reduction in fire. So the fire had kept the trees out. So it changed the disturbance pattern in this particular case. Um, again, but the, the, the thing that, that people don't kind of realize is that you see a grassland savanna system, you say, well, it can't support forests. Well, no, it's really a disturbance pattern that you're changing in this particular case. So let's change to a different area. Uh, the ladies in the foreground there are doing some work for me on some bioenergy. Um, this is in South Africa. This is a eucalyptus plantation. Um, it's being harvested in the background split up and, and sort of done into bolts. This is all going to be for, for paper. Any idea how old these guys are? I don't think I said, oh, I said it there, 12 years. Um, so typical, typical plantation. Um, I've seen them harvested. In this range, is about 30, 35 meters tall. Uh, just unbelievably productive um, in terms of producing fiber. I've seen it down to about seven years, um, more coastal areas. Um, super, super productive, just massively productive. And again, all through, through South America as well. Um, but this was all afforested savanna, right? This was all just wide open, essentially tall grass prairie. Um, their equivalent of tall grass prairie. This is in eastern South Africa, um, where they get the summer rains, um, sort of a very dry winter period. Um, burning in South Africa seems to be the national pastime um, in the wintertime when everything sort of browns up. Um, just everything goes on, everything turns on fire. It's quite amazing. Um, yeah, you're, I mean, the, the field behind your house, sort of everything, just like it all goes up in flames. <laughs> and so, but because they keep the fuels down, it's, it's, it's completely um, innocuous, right? You can just do it. You don't even worry about it. You know, the stuff turns on fire and there's no fire trucks. There's nobody even pays attention. It's just like, well, just burn it. It's like, okay. Um, but in this particular case, it was really that, that disturbance regime that was changed. Um, it wasn't the fact that they couldn't produce 
um, trees that didn't have enough, vegetable, enough water to produce um, forest systems. Um, so I really didn't think too much about it. Um, get into climate change, but things are messy um, in forests, right? The, 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 the spatial scale that you have to deal with and temporal scale as well. Uh, this is a very, you probably have seen this figure um, in the past. This is a fairly common figure. Um, it was in the, I think it was in the IPCC. Um, it was in the climate change impact report, everything else in terms of recent past, in terms of forest cover, and then projected forest cover. Um, I'm here to tell you this is not right. Um, it's absolutely incorrect, the one on the right. Um, but I have no idea what it's actually going to look like. <laughs> I tried to trace this back. Uh, this particular publication, uh, something assessment, whatever it is, it keeps getting self-referenced. I actually can't find the original paper, which worries me a little bit. Um, it keeps getting self-referenced as well. We referenced this one, but it referenced the, yeah, it, it's, I can't find the original publication that, that actually did this, but I'm here to tell you that it's not right. Um, it's just, it's quite a difficult um, subject um, in terms of, of how forests are going to change. Um, it's largely a disturbance. It's largely a human-mediated issue. Most of these um, studies, the ones that I've looked at, have really looked at sort of, well, what, how would it change in a natural system without, with no humans, with no barriers to movement, with natural um, disturbance patterns in this particular case, or no disturbance patterns. However, you just have um, sort of a climate driver. But we have such a human-dominated landscape. Um, in turn, and, and forests are so incredibly modified by disturbance because they have a very long time scale. So mm -hmm. ice storms, wind storms, hurricanes, insects and disease, everything else along these, along these lines. So only a couple more minutes. Um, see how far we get because I really want to leave it more open to questions. Landscape perspectives. Um, certainly you need to rectify your income complete understanding. Not everything can be done on, on a very large scale. Sometimes you just have to hone in. Um, and this is an example of a, of a designed experiment. You can see the plots. They're about two to four acres in size. So here, here, you can see a, a control plot um, as well. It's a long-term experiment, 1984. They went in, they harvested in 1984 on some plots, not on other plots. They brought fire in on some plots, not on other plots, sort of in a factorial experiment. Um, the no fire control is up in the top right. Um, it's just a mature cross timbers forest, about 89 years old. There's largely no trees there beforehand. Um, you know, it was more open, tall grass prairie. If you bring back, if you harvest and bring back fire on a four year interval, if it's here on a two year interval, this is where the, the surprise comes. This is where you have to get down into the weeds and really do the experiments. Um, the four year interval, you would think that would be enough. That's pretty often. But it's coming back very, very quickly to a forest. Essentially, after 30 years, we're almost to the point of crown closure again. Um, it's regenerated back to tree species, pine, oak species. If you burn on a two-year interval or a one-year interval annually, that keeps it in that open savanna system as well. So they didn't do any restoration here. They didn't plant any of these grasses. You don't see any grasses in the top, sort of those big four prairie grasses. Um, they're all here. They're, they're, they're around. It just comes back naturally. First year after cutting, they had a pretty good, um, it was a pretty wet year. They had that tall grass prairie in Savannah up about this high. Um, very wet years, it gets about this tall, 2011, sort of knee high. So very, very, very responsive. That tall grass prairie is very responsive to, to um, your climate. Uh, the forest, less so. What are the appropriate landscape patterns? That's a big question that we're trying to work on. Um, you know, does it look like this? Is it sort of your prototypical um, African savanna system, where you'll have trees and the gullies and the wet areas, and then more or less just open grassland everywhere else. Or is it more sort of intermixed, sort of a woodland, um, some scattered trees, some dense patch, patches, everything else? It makes a difference. What they're going for, at least in, in eastern Oklahoma, looks more like this. Um, more sort of scattered but uniform trees rather than clumpy. Um, it's just it's easier to deal with. It's easier to deal with as a logger as well. Modeling is absolutely essential uh, to project some of these changes forward and project them over, over those temporal and spatial scales that you have to deal with in forestry. Um, what are the carbon dynamics, for example, as you move from this system to this system? Water, 
nutrients make a big difference, the species makes a big difference, the disturbance makes a big difference. You really have to integrate that all with, with models. That's primarily what I do. Carbon dynamics, I'm going to skip that one because I really want to get to some of the drought impacts, uh, potential drought impacts in Oklahoma, East Texas forests. Drought impacts are um, likely to be here. They're unlikely to be directly through growth reduction. They're most likely to be through insect damage in this particular case. Same thing, bark beetles. Those are the main drivers of disturbance. So, but there's a bit more, but I'm, I'm, we're out of time, so we're going to essentially take questions, we'll grab the lights, and see what we've got. But that was really it. I mean, I just sort of wanted to sort of give a, a, a different perspective on, on the types of research that you might have to do if you deal with very large scale, um, large scale and large temporal areas as well. So, turn it off.